This is On The Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey everyone, welcome to On The Market. I'm your host, Dave Meyer, joined today by James Daner. James, what's going on? Oh, just just hanging in there with, with the confusion in life. I feel like I'm constantly confused right now. <laughs> right before we, we turned the recording on, I asked James if he had seen that GDP uh, actually went up in Q3 of 2022, and I've, I think I've scrambled James's brain. I felt like I just got smacked in the head. I was like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> when you're like kind of blank out for a second, I'm like, that... You you just <laughs> totally. I'm gonna go digging deep now and figure out what's going on because that I would not expect that this morning. No, I was not expecting it at all. And just for context for anyone listening to this, GDP just a measure of the uh, total output of the U.S. economy. It went down in the first two quarters of 2022, uh, mostly driven by inflation, um, because the economy is growing but not enough to overcome inflation, basically, and that definition, two consecutive declines of GDP is some people consider to be the traditional definition of a recession. It's not. I've done a show all about this. The way a recession is defined is super complicated by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and they do it retroactively. They're not even trying to do it in real time. But it's funny because like a lot of people, myself included, when you see like two, you two quarters GDP growth, you're like, oh, this is this is kind of a recession or something. But now nothing's really like changed in the economy. It still feels as daunting as it has for the last six months. But now we're seeing GDP growth. It's super confusing. I, I don't I mean, tomorrow they're going to come out and say rates fell two points. I don't know. Like, I, I, every, every, every morning I'm like, what's going on? This does. It. You know, when you're like a kid and you have like opposite day and you just start doing everything the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. Yes. I feel like that's where we're at right now. Jane was uh, my partner. Jane was asking me something uh, about what I thought was going to happen. And I was like. Well, this is what I actually think, but since nothing makes any sense anymore, I'm just going to go with the complete opposite and just start betting against myself because nothing makes sense. Yeah, everything is going against the predictions. I don't, I don't, yeah, nothing logically makes sense right now. It is like, it's it's like opposite day and Groundhog's Day every day. You're like, <laughs> wait, what happened this morning? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Well, I wish we had more to tell you about why this was going on, but this news just dropped and we're just confounded by it. So... With that, let's get into our guest today, AJ Osborne, who's a good friend of yours, I know, uh, and is one of the premier self-storage investors in the entire country, and he just dropped some knowledge. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. What did you uh, what did you learn about on this one, and what do you think people should be listening out for? Uh, well, I, I learned that there is an oversupply of self-storage coming, just like everything else. I kind of thought it was... to. You know, with all the upzoning and, um, you know, the need for pe- all the stuff that people bought over the last two years, I thought that was going to keep going up. But just like everything, everything kind of got overbuilt and it could come backwards. But it was a very interesting conversation. I love AJ. Me and him like to uh, work long hours and live off energy drinks. So he's like, <laughs> he's like the <laughs> kindred, kindred spirits. <laughs> for kindred, yeah, I'm in the, the fix and flip and multi and he's self storage. But it's, <laughs> we're very, very similar. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but after that, we will bring on AJ Osborne to talk about self-storage. AJ Osborne, welcome to On The Market. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. Well, for those people who haven't heard you, I know you're a, you're a regular on the uh, real estate podcast circuit, but for people who haven't heard you before, can you give us a little background about your investing experience? Yeah, 100%. So um, I uh, got started a long time ago, uh, pre-08, um, and I was, in, I was in insurance sales, so we managed like companies' health benefits, dollars, like we would do work with like self-funding, things like that. But it was like sales. So we were out selling corporate clients like B2B sales, right? Um, And that meant we had really unstable incomes. So I got paid only by, I didn't have a a base income, right? It was, I got paid on commissions. Um, It was a good gig, but we were taxed at the highest rate. And we also uh, had wildly fluctuating income. So uh, we were making good money, 
but we had to live on very little. Me and my wife had to literally live on like 30% of our income because we didn't know what, you know, it was. So it, it was, that's, that was the life that we were living at the time. And it was like, we got to offset this. We got to do something here. Uh, you know, I guess I kind of thought like, this is financial freedom because I was in control of my time, everything else. But it really turned out to be more of a slave because I had all these bosses. And so we were just trying to get out of that rat race and try to protect my family with actually steady income. Um, and we needed some tax benefits because uh, we were hit at the highest rate you could possibly imagine of anybody. Uh, so we started to get into real estate. And when we were looking at real estate, everything I did because we were on commission basis was cash flow. So it was just all cash flow basis. I didn't understand anything about this real estate world and equity, right? So when we started looking at deals, we were looking at like single family homes, multifamily. I didn't understand how people were buying them. It didn't make sense to me how people were making money when I'm like, I haven't seen one deal that cash flows, right? And what year was that? This was 2005. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we were, you know, it was right in the heart of it. Um, and it, it, the real estate world made no sense at all to me. Um, so we looked and thought, how can we get our, we were used to having an effect on income through sales. Like I, I understood that I want to be able to affect revenue, but I also needed that passivity and everything of real estate. So we found an asset class called self storage at the time. Nobody invested in storage. It was literally when we told people, we're like, oh, we're, we're buying uh, these little storage facilities in these dinky towns on the middle of nowhere. People are like, you're a slumlord? Um, they were considered junkyards. And banks didn't like them. So we did a lot of uh, seller financing, right? Uh, it was all, though, we were buying purely on cash, ca or cash flow. It, it needed to make us good cash on cash returns. Um, and we couldn't use a lot of leverage. So we did that. We stopped buying um, for in 07. We started in 04, excuse me. Then 07, we stopped and started back in 2010. Um, and we kept going and we built a great portfolio. We were doing essentially a commercial burr, which we call it the bird. So I call it the bird because what we're doing is we're buying, we're improving, but then we can do something you can't do on like single family homes. And that's, we can reduce risk in two forms. We can take our capital out. So the money that we put in, we go in, we buy it, we put 30% down. That's what you have to do, uh, for self-storage facilities. You'd take that leverage out. We'd get no prepayment penalties on it. We would then buy assets. We could affect the revenue through rate increases, marketing, a whole bunch of other stuff that we were doing. We treated it like a business. We didn't view it as an asset. Lift that in, uh, income up. Three years later, we refinance our money out of it. So we'd get our capital back. It would still cash flow at the same debt ratio. So 30% equity, right? Um, but we would then move that into a non-recourse loan. So I would have my money out plus my profits and then I got that off my liability and we were non-recourse, which means we didn't sign on the debt. So if it went under, they couldn't take us. And then we would use that money and reinvest it back into another storage facility while still owning the one while not having the risk. And we did this for a long period of time while I was selling insurance. Uh, me and my dad, I followed in my dad's footsteps to sell insurance. He was born in um, like extreme poverty. So he didn't have running water. He had to poach for food. Um, literally he had an outhouse in the high rural deserts of Idaho that he'd have to walk to at negative 20 degrees. They were extreme poverty, um, no food. And, uh, so he used sales to get out of it. So we were both doing this, right? It was great. I was with my dad. We were selling together. We're doing everything. Uh, uh we were buying real estate and we thought, yeah, man, we just hit it, right? This is amazing. I, I get to work with my best friend. I get to do all this cool stuff. Um, and we were doing really good in selling insurance and out of the blue, I, uh, became a quadriplegic paralyzed from head to toes. And, uh, I was taken to the hospital. Uh, by my wife because one night my legs stopped working. I was put on, I was put into a coma, and it, they put me onto life support, hooked me to tubes. And when I woke up, I was paralyzed from the eyes down, um, and I was in extreme pain. I didn't even get to say goodbye to my kids. It was like that. Uh, and then um, I laid there for months on life support, hooked up to tubes. I couldn't eat, speak, drink, nothing. I communicated through blinking. Um, and these little plastic things. Um, and I was fired from my job in the hospital. So I worked for a, a big fortune 
500 company based out of Chicago, and I was let go. And uh, um, I, you know, it was at, at the time I was literally it was Christmas Eve. And I'll never, ever forget it because I was in the hospital looking outside. It was a rehab facility at the time. I went in there when it was warm um, and I'd moved from hospital to LTAC long-term care. Then they finally moved me to a rehab facility. It was Christmas Eve. The snow was falling. I was going to get to go home for the first time to see my kids. They were going to open up their presents. The hospital was letting me go with an escort home. And I was so excited. And I was like, I know my wife's spoiling my kids. I just knew it. I was like, she's totally going to spoil them. You know, dad's been gone for ever. And, uh, um, I, I thought I'm not worried about losing my house. I'm not worried about my wife leaving our now four kids. We just had a baby to go work while she has a paralyzed husband and someone else has to take care of our kids. Um, and that was all because of uh, that real estate. So it became something that was, it, it became my why. And then after that, we, I said, I'm going to teach this. We're going to allow other people to invest with us. I started the private equity side and we've been doing that for over five, uh, five years now. So that's my story. That's what I do and why I do it. It's an incredible story, AJ. I've, I've heard you tell it once or twice before, but every time you do, it's, it's both, uh, it's, it's just incredibly inspiring that you were, you were able to overcome an incredibly challenging situation and, are helping other people achieve the same level of financial freedom that, that you have achieved. So thanks for telling that story. I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's somewhat of a painful memory, but, uh, also, uh, you're, you're using it for good now. Yes. Yeah. It was hard to talk about for the first, um, uh, few years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, um, I, I think, uh, talking about it actually helps. And I wish people would talk more about that because that's what people relate to, right? We're all struggling. We're all going through it. And honestly, real estate is great. It is. But I mean, we're all doing it for a reason, right? At the end of the day, as much as I love storage, and I do, I'm a total storage nerd. I know everything <laughs> about it. I, I own uh, tech companies in the storage space. Um, started, uh, started them. I own, uh, started founding member of the largest co-op in the world in self storage. I sit on boards. I have the largest communication platform, including the book and the largest podcast in the self storage space. Um, but at the end of the day, they're metal boxes that people rent. Right. And so it's really more of like what this vehicle or this asset class does, uh, for us. And I know everybody feels that way. And once you get that attachment to like what the asset does for me, and what the game is and how we're playing the game, that's when it becomes really, really fun and people really fall in love. So that gets you over all the frustrating times, all the hard times, because it is, real estate is hard. It's not easy, right? There's things that come up and everybody likes to say how passive it is. And you can make it passive if you're investing with somebody else. But when you're doing it on your own, it is not that passive, right? Um, and building a real estate company is definitely not passive. So you got to understand it and love it. And it's got to have meaning. Yeah, I, I love that. And absolutely. Like it being doing what you both do is entrepreneurship. Like there's no there's no easy route to entrepreneurship. It is it is definitely a difficult business. And hopefully you achieve at some point being able to uh, invest with other people. But you both are actively working and, and hustling really hard. But um, yet, yeah, like you said, that that uh, that why and having a really solid reason to, to do it, I'm sure helps you uh, push through it. So you've you've told us your, your incredible story. I'd love to hear, you know, you're talking about how you know the game. Tell us what's going on in the self storage game these days. What's what's the landscape for self storage at, at this point in 2022? Yeah, so self storage, um, like I, it's, it's so weird. I really do love this asset class. Um, and one of the reasons I think I love it so much is, uh, how misunderstood it is. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> really don't get self storage. It's just, they just don't. It's, it's this weird asset class that people look at and they think it's something that it's not. Um, and so it's fun for me cause I get to educate and people are like, oh, wow, this is incredible. This part of it. I didn't even know this. And then also, oh, wow, there's a lot of misconceptions around it. So I think some of the first things you have to think about storage is a lot of people think, oh, it's just because people are storing their junk, right? And that misconception led to a lot of people prior to 2008, nobody wanted to invest in it. There's a lot of things that people perceived that it was risky. So prior to 2008, um, self-storage is the newest commercial real estate asset 
um, in the uh, commercial real estate asset groups. It was it came about really in the 80s and started to take hold in the 90s and exploded after 2008. And what a lot of people don't realize is prior to 2008, institutions did not play in self-storage. So banks weren't majorly involved in it. You didn't have funds. You didn't have any of those things that were in self-storage. And one of the reasons why was, well, not one, two, the two reasons why was first, the inability to manage and operate them. Self-storage is a business. It's not a real estate asset. In fact, it mirrors much closer to like a retail or a hotel. Um, than it does anything else. Why? We have short-term contracts. We have lots of products, meaning units that have different people. There's different reasons that people utilize it from businesses to everything else. So operationally, uh, it looks super passive when you're comparing it to an apartment complex because nobody's living in it. But business operationally, it's much more complicated. I look at apartment buildings and I'm like, wow, that is so passive. Like, what do you do all day when you own one? It's, you know, because it's just, we're marketing. You have to do all this kind of stuff all the time. So prior to 2008, there was no institutional grade third-party management. So if I'm a fund and I want to put a hundred million or a billion dollars into that asset class, what am I supposed to do with it? How do I manage it? And then second, it had never been through a debt cycle. So it had never been through a major cycle. So the banks and institutions and funds, they couldn't underwrite this asset class. So during the 90s, you had a boom in development of all the other commercial real estate assets, right? Everything from hotels to retail centers to the super Kmarts and Walmarts, and you had all of it, right? Everything from housing in the late uh, 90s, it all exploded and developed. Self-storage didn't. It didn't go through a major development cycle. After 2008, you had companies like Extra Space, that's a REIT, they developed institutional grade third party management, and it had now been through a real estate cycle. More importantly, it was the best performing asset during the Great Recession. Um, and all of a sudden, everybody took notice, because it wasn't just the best performing, it blew every other asset out of the water. As of right now, still to this day, 26 years later, it is the top performing and the lowest defaulting commercial real estate asset. So after 2008, everybody had just gotten slaughtered in all these asset classes. They went bankrupt and they were like, we got to find somewhere to put it. I know real estate. I don't know, you know, where do we go? And self-storage became the winner. And uh, we, the landscape changed. Once institutions came in, people started to realize you win this game through businesses, uh, business and technology. Technology started to come in, big money came in. And the self-storage development boom started. And that started in 2016. And we went from the highest point ever on development was about a billion dollars prior. Every single year after that, it was like five times that. We hit two, three billion. Then we were hitting five billion a year. So since 2015, we've not even eclipsed. We've blown out the development of any uh, previous high ever known. And from there... Self-storage was changed forever. So prior to 2008, because that is a kind of a, it's that's interesting that the banking became easier in 2008 and nine for this kind of product, considering what was going on in the banking market. In general, I mean, the banks were like melting down during that time. Um, so how, how were those deals like when you guys started looking at these in 2005? Right. So it, it, I, so you guys were looking for asset classes to invest in. You wanted a higher yield. Yeah. You end up selecting stuff storage over even other things that could also be high yield how 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 were those things debted though like i mean so if it wasn't big institutions was it all local banks or like i mean how, how did you take a deal down prior to 2008 credit unions local banks and seller financing is how we did it so we did a mixture of um local banks credit unions seller financing but it was really predicated like on our income so banks really viewed it like a home, not a commercial real estate asset. Uh, they were like, you got to pay this back. So we're looking at your income. We want to see how much money you have. And that really changed what we could do. So we had to go to cities that like no one's ever heard of. Like we went to a, our first facility, you know, that we did was Bonners Ferry, Idaho, which is literally like a population 400. Like nobody's ever heard of this place, right? It's There's more grizzly bears than there are people there. And uh, um, it, it, 
it's just out in the middle of nowhere, so we could buy a cheap asset. We had to put a lot of money down, and they the banks looked at our assets. I want to see your home. I want to see your bank account, right? Whereas today, the banks don't really look at our assets. Um, and the, in commercial real estate, the financing is viewed much more on the asset than it is the person. So from there, we'd go, but they'd cap us out. Like they didn't want to lend a lot of money to us on storage. Um, where other real estate asset classes like multifamily or whatnot, they didn't care what your income, your debt to income was. That was irrelevant, right? Storage, it wasn't at the time. So then we would have to go negotiate with sellers, do seller financing. But to give you an idea of how much people didn't want this asset, we were sitting down on one of our deals prior to 08 and we were in negotiations with the lady that owned it. And she's like, yeah, I want a 10 cap. And we're like, yeah, we'll pay like a 12 cap. And two, you're going to sell or finance this and we're not going to have recourse. You're going to, it's going to be at 3%. You know, I mean, it was just like, we're the only people here to buy this. There's nobody else coming. And so we had all the ability to basically set what we were doing. So we were, those banking terms were like that. Think about this. We're buying nine caps, 10 caps, and banks didn't want to lend money to it. But they were lending to homes, duplexes, multifamily at negative carry. And so crazy. Is that because like, because I remember 2008, like there was a lot of defaults going on in small storage facilities. Like we, I mean, to be honest, I I just blew it on a couple because it was hard to get debt on them. But is it because, do you think like 2008 kind of reset the market as far as, because what a lot of the operators back then were just kind of mom and pop, small you know, small owners and they kept really poor books. Yeah. Like it was like, you couldn't get leases, right. You didn't know what it was. The rent rolls were all over the place. It, it would, do you think that's kind of when that all changed 2008, the defaults went up and then the institutions and investors like you kind of cleaned up the whole business. And that's why there's more financing available. Cause I remember yes. we look at things and people are like, we don't have leases. The P and L's would be all over the place and we're, we couldn't get a loan for for, for anything just because there was no substance it was just a like you said a tin box on a piece of land with no real true income um i, I almost feel like that's like 2008 reset a lot of things yeah mom and pop is an understatement you're exactly right seriously dude like it was and still we find these i i'm negotiating with a guy he has um get this we were negotiating with a guy with 500,000 net rentable square feet can you send us over your like printout on your uh, management summary? We keep it all by hand, by paper in the office. You have to come here to our location and go through the paper. And Xerox it. And so, yeah, because that's what it was done prior to 2008. And one of the reasons that was done was because banks wouldn't loan on it. So the people that were buying them and building them, it was almost all cash. So one of the things that people don't realize – Self-storage had such a low default rate. Well, at the time, self-storage debt to uh, uh, income or debt to value, it was like 30% debt. So they survived, but yeah, they had no debt. So of course they survived, right? Um, But the ones that did default were ones that couldn't refinance and needed to, right? Because then, like you were saying, they have all this paper stuff. Banks were gone. And we couldn't get bank financing for self-storage for... It didn't become easy till like 2014, 15. So it still took a while, even because that's when institutions came. So after 2008, we had years where we couldn't get financing. And then you uh, have all these people that either need to refinance, they couldn't, or they had just developed storage and they were done. It was out. So we bought a lot of those people up. Um, and so, yeah, it's very important to recognize, even though it was the lowest defaulting, doesn't mean there was not defaults. People get that confused. There was. And there were defaults at astronomically low debt. Um, so when we're buying them, our whole business model, Jimmy, to your point, is we're going out and we're buying these things that are ran like that. And we're turning them around. We're updating them on technology. Our, our original business plan was this. We're going to actually pick up the phone and we're going to collect bills. That's it. We'll just pick up the phone and we'll make people pay their, their, uh, uh, rent. And that was a winning strategy in the space. <laughs> so, um, it was very mom and pop. Who was, who was even developing these things back in the nineties and early two thousands before some of the institutions got in? It was mostly home, um, developers that were developing huge 
neighborhoods and they would have these pieces of land that they didn't know what to do with mm-hmm. and storage was really cheap. And so they'd be like, well, we have this land, we're developing this, so we'll go throw these on. Or it had uh, a few of the large players. So there were handfuls of large players, but 90% of the industry when we got into it was mom and pop, uh, single operator owned. Then 10% uh, were large guys, right? Um, that is dramatically changed now. So through this, what everybody, what we're all talking about here, what James, David, and me are talking about is consolidation. So consolidation happened due to the change in financing the players and the leverage of operations and technology in the space. And that's what we did. That's why we got into it. We went into it to consolidate the uh, space in the industry. That's what we do. We're trying to buy them all up, turn them around, package them in, And we are in the, so we're in the top 70 self-storage operators in the world. Um, uh, Our portfolio is at, uh, we did it here yesterday. We actually had to line it up. At a five cap, it's over 300 million. Um, We have 33% uh, debt to uh, equity on average and over 60% of them uh, I own with my partner uh, individually. And uh, so when you look at, the bigger players, which I don't even consider myself one. Now, if you went back to 2008, we would have been one of the biggest in the world, like in the top 10, probably. Uh, But that changed fast. Well, so I'm curious about that, because there's a lot of fear in the single family and multifamily residential space about the entrance of technology and institutional investors and Wall Street. And it sounds like something similar has happened here, but are you afraid of that? Or like, do you see them as competition or how has that changed your business? I do see them as competition, but that just means we were innovative and that's why I own a tech company. That's why we started uh, the tech company. That's why we started the co-op. And it was to just combat with that. Now, I'm a lot more worried about that in storage than I am single family houses. Uh, the reason is branding and the how you attract your customers. So you should be concerned about institutional market consolidation when you're in an industry like a hotel. So prior to the 80s, right, hotels were outrageously fragmented. Now they're all under five brands. And why? Because of customer acquisition. So self-storage, 85% of our customers are acquired from online. That means if you win the online space and you can attract it, you own the market, right? So if you look at two self-storage facilities on a street, they dramatically perform differently. Even if they're the exact same unit, same size, same location, the operators change the performance. You don't have that kind of leverage and that change in single family homes. So consolidating single family homes, you change the buyers, right? That's, that's what you're changing. Somebody is buying more than another person, but the person that's buying more isn't fundamentally changing the business model or the acquisition of customers or anything else that they can leverage and outperform their neighbor by leaps and bounds, right? Market rents are fairly set for us. We do things like dynamic pricing, meaning every day, all my rates are changing. We're acquiring different types of customers. We're doing all this lead stuff. We're generating. It's a big machine that we can use and leverage data, and we can actually beat our competitors, right? That's not really how that works in an asset like that. So so self-storage, we were worried about it. We've invested a ton in it because we didn't want to end up like hotels. But even even Sam Zell tried to do that with um, apartments, right? And it didn't work. To brand them. Yeah, brand. Right? Yeah. You tried to brand. It's like, oh, you do it. it didn't work, right? Um, because nobody cared about those things. Where <laughs> it's different in certain types of asset classes. It, what what AJ's talking about right there is so important. As like investors try to scale and get into bigger projects, running the business side because you know everyone, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people think of real estate is just an asset you buy, you manage it, and you collect cash flow. But the business side is where your whole portfolio can change. And like what AJ's talking about, like running, you know, self-storage, I I think is so unique because you really do have to operate your business well, not just buy the real estate right. But as you scale up with apartments, apartments have gotten in that kind of same uh, kind of category as well. Like as we're going out and getting debt on these large sites, like, uh, you know, we're buying an 80-unit building. 
the bank is going through all of our websites. They want to see yeah. that we are an actual business, though, that we are not just real estate investors. And that is really, really key and important for people to realize as we go into some sort of recessionary market, it's so important that you actually build the business because the bank will give you more leverage. They'll give you better terms and they will actually they'll, they'll commit to you more if you do run, you know, professional websites, uh, manage it well. You know, like for us, we're building a master website right now for all of our apartments, right? They all tie in together and it yep. shows the infrastructure behind it. Yes. And, and that's where the whole leverage game changes. And that's why that changed 2008. As people get more professional, there's more money available. But it, self storage or apartments, you, you if you want to scale, you need to invest in the infrastructure. And it's a totally different skill, right? Like it's not yes. the same as going out and finding and underwriting deals like customer acquisition, marketing, you know, following up, collecting rent. Like you said, like it's a different business and you need to find, I, I assume you have a whole team, AJ, of people who are helping you building these, this like marketing engine that you're, that's required. Yeah. I have a, over 80 employees. Um, and when we look at this on just that self-storage side, that's not the tech companies, anything else. That's my more, or what we would call direct reports. What you guys are talking about, what Jimmy's talking about is really important. When people are like, well, is it easy to get debt? Like, d does, does that bank, would that bank want self-storage? Would they want to lend to self-storage? I'm like, I don't know if the bank would want to lend to self-storage, but the bank would want to lend to me. And it's not because of my financial stance. It's not because they go, you have a lot of money in the bank. That's not it at all. It's because of what Jimmy said. They're looking and say, you have the infrastructure to pull it off. That's the difference. So they're looking at your customer acquisition costs? Yes. Yeah. There's, right. They don't ask, hey, AJ, how much money do you have in a bank? Now we're going to loan to you. No, they say, what's your site look like? What's your customer acquisition process look like? What's going to happen if we are in a high vacancy area, right? They're looking at the execution on commercial assets. That's what they want to see. It's not, you know, it's not nearly about you, you. You can have somebody that has way more money than I have, way more money in the bank, right? And they went to get a loan on a self storage, and the bank's going to be a lot more hesitant to give them money, if at all, than they would be for me, or anybody else that creates a plan to really execute and has the right business partners, has the right business um, associated with them to get this done. So to, the better you can showcase how you are professional, what you're doing to build a business, how you look, create a business plan, that is going to help you infinitely in getting loans. That's that's incredible advice. I, uh, I think that's something people truly overlook all the time is sort of like the operational piece. They, everyone wants to go out and, and just find the deal because it's fun. It's definitely fun yeah. doing that. But you have to back that up with uh, operational excellence, especially if you're trying to get the kind of debt you're looking at. Well, you said something. Yeah, go ahead. I just I, I want to make sure it's very clear. People are like, well, if I don't have that, that doesn't mean I can't get the loan. That's not what we're saying. So there are third party management companies. There are ways that you can set up. If you, do you have an LLC? Do you have a website? Do you have a professional looking uh, presence? Do you have a presentation and a business plan full of partners, abilities, strategy that you're going to execute that you can explain? That's what I'm talking about. Going in and saying, this is a good deal and I want money for it. <laughs> they go, okay, uh, I'm a bank. I don't know if it's a good deal. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about storage. Is it a good deal? I have to know that you know you're going to show me why it's a good deal and what you're going to do to make sure it's safe and profitable. The more that you can teach me as the bank and explain to me your business plan in a professional manner, the more trust I gain for you to execute on something that I don't know. It doesn't matter if you have zero employees. It doesn't matter if you have any experience. You need to be able to show them you have a plan, right? And a lot of people treat it like they're buying their personal residence. And it's like, well, here's my income. What will you give me as a loan? That doesn't, that's not how this works, right? And uh, people need to, whether you're buying a duplex, a single family, you got to start changing your mind about how you talk to banks, what your value proposition is to banks. A lot of people don't realize that and they don't understand why banks don't want to give them money, but they're giving Bob down the street money. And you're like, I make more money than Bob. Why are you giving him money? Right? Well, it's because Bob has it together.
right? He's got a business plan. He has an execution strategy. He's partnered up with so-and-so. He knows what he's talking about, or at least looks like he does. That's, that's great advice. Uh, I want to I want to ask you about something you said where you said that two different storage spaces on the same street will perform really differently, largely based on brand. I've just noticed this um, in Denver, where I used to live, that the self storage facilities were building in, I would think, higher and higher priced places. And I was always kind of curious about that, like in urban infill instead of sort of on the outskirts. Yeah. And I was just curious, like, what is it about lo or like how location dependent is storage and why would they be willing to pay that high price for the dirt when there's seemingly you can put them anywhere? Yeah. Self storage left the industrial parks. They left the back alleys and they went to the corners. Um, Self-storage is now being considered more infrastructure. It's also now being considered more key type real estate assets. But in order for cities to recognize that, which it's taken them a long time, you had to show, and if you, you've probably noticed, and a lot of people have, um, they look different today. They're swanky now. They're, They're swanky. Nice. Yeah. They've got lights. I'm expecting like a cocktail yep. bar in the, in the self storage. Oh, yeah. Facility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we put a lot of money into those things. I'm developing a $40 million storage facility uh, right now. And it's when we're working with uh, cities, when we're working with county commissioners and residents. I mean, you're showing them something that looks better than the office buildings and everything around. Um, so self-storage has, has changed. And what you find is customers really care about, first of all, how it looks, how it feels, safety and security, convenience. So you don't go out, like you're not going to drive past three facilities to get to a storage facility. That's not how it works, right? Mm -hmm. Convenience trumps everything. Mm -hmm. And self-storage is outrageously sensitive to supply and demand. So the more that you can get with the people that is your target market that will pay the right prices and generate that product offering, self-storage is competitive, right? You will stop all those customers from going down to the other facility or the ones you want. So in self-storage, we have three different types of customers. You have customers that care about price. You have customers that care about location and you have customers that care about quality, right? The price driven ones, I don't want, right? Those can go to the infill, the junkyard, everything else, right? They can go to the industrial and they can drive to pay that $5 difference or whatever it is. That's actually, I think the smallest class of people. That's a very small one. Um, most people care about location and quality. 60, over 60% 60 of all of the decision makers on renting a storage unit are female. Now, they may not be the ones that are doing it, but they're the ones that have the end say on, I'm not renting there because I'm not going to go drive in there. I don't feel safe, right? So that really changed the way. And when you look at a, at a model that is driven on operations and you can leverage it, and different product offering and types to different types of people, it changed the way we look at, at where they should be. It changed the way once they started building nice ones that looked like hotels and office buildings, it changed the way the city accepted and would allow them to uh, be as part of the community. Now, generally speaking, cities don't like storage for a few reasons. Uh, the first reason is they are the lowest tax basis of like any commercial asset. No one's living there. You have no businesses that are there. Right. As far as a per square foot basis, it is astronomically low tax revenue to the city and it doesn't hire anybody. So cities don't generally like it because of that reason. But it is now in most places considered infrastructure and uh, cities know they need to have them. They need to have them somewhere and they're working with them. Yeah, and there's there's also the kind of as human nature starts to evolve. Right. Like in, in 1990s, we had a lot of McMansions getting built big homes big lots oversized and then you know over the last 20 years we've you know like i just saw that california came out with something where you can actually go you can condominize any lot single family lot in all yeah. california and it doesn't even matter if you have an hoa and the hoa says you can't do it it supersedes it so now you know affordable housing and these little cottages are popping up everywhere i know in seattle we're we're building a bunch uh, we had thomas james Holmes on not too long ago and they're building a lot of cottages and they're maximizing the ratio of what you can cover on these lots right and so a property that had one house on it now can have three to four 
and and what that but the space is also substantially smaller like in also Washington they 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 the governments are going and going through the trouble of making sure these big houses aren't built anymore they've maximized the far coverage to where you know if we have a 5000 square foot lot in Seattle we can only build a 2500 square foot house where we used to be able to build a 4000 and so it's shrinking the structure of these buildings and and I also think that's why the trend is you're seeing uh, the storage units come more in fill because before it was kind of for like toys and random junk in the middle of nowhere. Now it's out of necessity. Like if you have an 800 square foot, two bedroom, one bath house, you're going to need space to stick your stuff. Um, because a lot of these also don't have garages either. And so what, with, with that kind of transition going on and we're seeing this kind of evolve, where, where's the forecasting at for that with the, all this, you know, affordable condominized small lot housing is, you know, it, it almost feels like the hedge funds might have known about this prior because I started seeing all these structures go up everywhere, like in Seattle, and they weren't getting filled, and now they're in high, high demand. And it, I was actually really confused when I saw them going up everywhere. I'm like, why are these things going up everywhere? There's no demand. And then all of a sudden, they start filling in. It. Well, what's the forecast for that? I mean, because people are going to need to put their stuff somewhere. Either they're not going to buy stuff or they're going to need to put it somewhere. Yeah. This is the thing. When I said, you know, a lot of people don't understand storage, this is the thing that is the most misunderstood part of storage is demand. And the reason being is most people view storage as a product of excess. It's because we're hoarders. Everybody in America just spends lots of money, right? And they just buy tons of crap, which it's par partially true. It's not like that's totally not true, but it's actually, that's not the main driver. It's an, uh, so it is an economic as well as a regulatory function that is creating demand. So as you said, we are, people are downsizing, right? Um, people are going into smaller uh, areas, but also the homes, even the McMansions, so when you're in a McMansion today, you have an HOA. That HOA doesn't let you put an RV out front. When you want to go build a shop on the side, you can't do that. So we are more regulated over our real estate than we've ever been. So back in the 80s, right, when my dad wanted to buy a bunch of stuff, he wouldn't build a shed out in the backyard. And we would put our bikes in there. We'd put everything else in there, right? He can't do that. Or Bob would work out of his backyard. So Bob ran a plumbing company and he would take his truck in the backyard in the shed and go, you can't do any of that anymore. Space is regulated and it's downsizing and it's expensive. The price per square foot to build on the equivalent of a 10 by 20 for the average American makes no sense, especially at debt levels like this. So now all of a sudden it's cheaper to go rent a 10 by 20. Then you also have the fact you have regulatory issues, you have building constraints and cost, you have uh, more densely living people, but you have utilization. So in America, at the same time that price of real estate has skyrocketed, our ability to consume has dropped dramatically. And the way that we consume has, has changed. So instead of localizing goods, services, and products, we have now fragmented that distribution process through the internet where we don't we know we don't need to go to set locations to do that type of service this fragmentation of supply chains and the way that customers interact creates last mile problems so we've seen a surge in business utilization not only in industrial but also self storage and also now people can consume at a whim they can buy what they want and i know that i can live and i can have cheaper rent in an apartment because i live by myself but i can still have my motorcycle my skis and everything else so now why wouldn't i now in the 80s you couldn't where were you going to put it that wasn't even an option. And two, your price per unit on anything, a motorcycle, anything else, was astronomically higher in comparison to your relative income. So businesses now, they know that if I'm renting an office, if I, I'm my office here, right? Why in the world would I take up an office space that as an individual that is a revenue generating and producing individual to store files? That makes no business sense whatsoever because that space is so expensive and I can utilize that spent space to generate revenue from a worker, right? Or whatever it is. So I use a storage unit. We stash all our files, everything else over there. So this change in economic, uh, this economic change, this 
uh, supply change, this consumer change in business, that is fueled self-storage, right? Now, self-storage is probably overdone at this point. It just is. Uh, everyone's noticed it. It's been the talk over the last three, four years, right? They're everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Now, that is correlated with a rise in utilization, but it's about a point. So on average, we've remained uh, about nine, nine and a half percent utilization of storage in the general population. That's gone up to ten and a half. Um, but a lot of that increase was due to COVID. So I call it the COVID bump. Uh, on average, right now, for the last three years, we've seen 96 percent occupancy rates. The next previous high ever was 86 percent. So that's an abnormality that is not, I think, consistent with long-term use trends and demand for self-storage. And there's a lot of people that are going to get burned by that because they all rushed into high, high growth markets. They were building it up, but that, that infill and that utilization and demand was being driven from growth. And once that growth is gone, you have vacancies, right? And I think that will hit certain markets hard because it was just overdone. It was overbuilt. Um, and I, I think, you know, we will have a disparity, right, uh, in the coming years in performance and self-storage. Um, and that is going to be something I think that will happen in a lot of asset classes, right? But I think it will happen in storage in a way that it hasn't happened before, uh, principally because we didn't go through our development cycle. We never went through a development boom in self-storage till after 2015, so we are on the tail end of a development boom that had never been seen before. Well, of course, that creates excess in supply, right? So I, I think storage is incredible. People get it. It's, I mean, we have, you know, 40% margins. It's low capital expense intensity. Um, it, all the wonderful things that people already know about it and say these things are cash cows, right? But then you also have the downside of that, that demand surged from investors, right? They're easy to build. They have lower barriers of entry than most commercial assets of that size. So if you had a, um, let's say a multifamily unit. So let's say J James, you're going to like, okay, I'm going to go build a multifamily unit that has 500 doors, right? What's that going to cost you in Washington? Uh, about f that big of a project is like five to 600 a foot. That's because that's commercial. That's a big, that's an expensive build out. Yeah. So you're like six, seven times what it would cost me. So I could build something like that for under 10 million, right? And have 500 doors. So a lot of people, and I don't need plumbing. I don't need, I don't have all the issues, right? All that kind of stuff. So a lot of people turned to self storage and said, this is easy to develop. It's in high demand and it will fill up. And the market bailed people out. Meaning as the market went up, people could overbuild and they were okay. That's not normal. Right now, it may have had to do something with the three trillion dollars the government spent. I'm not sure, but it's probably something to do with that. Um, and so that no, not normal market cycle encouraged bad behavior because people were rewarded for it. And that's across all asset classes. Right. Um, but storage, I think it's going to be new because people didn't get previously burned in storage. So where housing was constrained because people were scarred from it. Housing is still constrained. Right. So there is a actual delta from houses needed to housing on the market. We don't have that in storage. Right. So um, when everybody else was burned from housing or whatever it was, retail, anything else prior, they weren't burned from uh, self storage. So they just thought this is an easy asset. And um, some of those markets are, are going to feel that, hey, when markets don't go up, you don't just get bailed out for bad decisions. So you're saying uh, self-storage is no different than every other asset class that has just been pumped <laughs> and juiced on the performance. <laughs> like it's just uh, – yep. there is no – that's uh, – I actually kind of thought a little bit – I didn't really think of it that way because I just thought it was more like smaller class so it couldn't get as pumped as much. But like it's – No. It's, it, I mean, yeah, it got juiced. So, so AJ, how do you – you know, do you recommend people who are listening to this get into self-storage? And if so, like what – what words of advice would you give anyone who is interested in this this asset class? I think self-storage is the best asset class for an individual to get into in commercial real estate. The reason being is this. Even though it has all the same problems now that all the other real estate asset classes have, none of those go away, right? And I think there was a common theme 
that self-storage is recession-proof, um, which is idiotic, but that's what people said. Um, I think they're going to learn that that's not true, right? Um, and so all that means now is, does that mean that people shouldn't get it? It just means it's like every other asset and you need to be smart when you're building and pick on demand. But what self-storage does, uh, what self-storage has that a lot of real estate asset classes don't have, the vast majority are mom and pop individual owned that are vastly underperforming their potential from decades of people owning these things that had no business in actual operating the, the, the facility, anything else like that. It's still over 50%. Compare that to multifamily, right? Well, the vast majority, 80% of multifamily is owned by institutions. So you have, and two, self-storage, they're everywhere. There's more self-storage than there are McDonald's, Starbucks combined, plus some, right? So the inventory, the ability for me as an individual to get into the self-storage game and buy it from a person that is not institutional grade and do very little easy fill-ups, right, and fix up to massively improve that, I still think is better than any other commercial real estate asset class out there. You can buy them in markets where institutions aren't. There, you can get them and they cash flow great, right? And uh, you need to watch out for the downsides to self-storage. I'm not here to simply prop up storage and say, yeah, everybody needs to get into it. And it's recession resistant and all the same, same crap you hear from, you know, everybody else talking about storage that's just trying to get investors or somebody else. That's just not true. And people are going to learn it. But if you understand what makes the downside in self-storage, it's easy to avoid. Like, you know, don't do stupid things. Don't go into a city where they're building 20% new inventory coming onto the market and think that you can understand demand and demand won't change, right? Um, so as long as you understand the downsides and you can avoid them, which you can, it's very easy to do. I think self-storage is the greatest commercial asset for an individual to start out in and get into. All right. That is great advice, AJ. I have about 20 more questions on my list I wanted to get to, but we do have to get out of here, unfortunately. And that was a, that was a great way to wrap up. So any, uh, any last thoughts uh, or, and can you tell us also where to find you if anyone is interested in learning more about you? And I know you have a lot of, uh, you have a book and your own podcast. Where, where should people find you? Yeah. Easiest way. I mean, you can go on to Instagram, AJ Osborne, uh, self-storage. We do all things related self-storage income. That's the website, uh, the podcast. Um, you can go jump on there and we just do infinite free information. It's all out there on YouTube, everything else that you can go consume to learn more. You can message us, email us directly from self storage income website. Um, and you can DM me on Instagram. Awesome. Well, AJ Osborne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it guys. Good to see you, bud. You too, man. That was so fun. I did not know a lot about self-storage and I just learned so much. <laughs> what did you think of all that? Uh, I know you know AJ pretty well, but what do you think of what he was saying? Yeah, I love AJ. Me and him go down the rabbit hole and we'll be on the... If, if, when me and him hop on the phone, it's usually a long conversation, like hours and going down rabbit holes. But yeah, no, I learned a lot. It's That is an asset class that I've always been interested in. You know, those high yield, like the mobile home parks, the self-storage, and just, you know, really... You, you do think about just going and buying this stuff, but you you need to run it like a business. Like it, you, if you're not geared up to manage it, then it's, it, he kind of reiterated that make sure you put all the pieces together before you just jump into any type of asset class. Cause I was thinking about getting in and like, I'm like I should buy one of these and see what it is. But I, I got a, a lot more work to do before I go down that road. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it actually reminded me when I first started at Bigger Pockets, my first job here was in growth marketing, which is a lot of what he's talking about, like using data to try and figure out how to acquire users, like trying to find the right people who are interested in our stuff and communicating to them effectively. It doesn't sound like a real estate business. You know, it sounds like much more like a software business or an operational business where you need a, a a very different skill set than I think you do just to purely buy residential. Yeah, it, it reminds, you know when you look at a multifamily deal and they give you the performa and then their their answer is, well, why is this a good deal? Is, oh, it's it's poorly managed. That's their number one <laughs> broker comment. Yes, exactly. Uh, poorly managed. 
that that is true in self storage, right? Like, and that's what he reiterated. That's maybe not always the case in apartments. They're just that's their excuse out. But if you do not run your your business right, you're not going to get money, and it, it is not going to run correctly. So that oh, is, I I could totally see it, right? Like, I have this uh, short term rental that's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and the town probably is like. 15, I don't know, 15 structures in the whole town. And two of them are self-storage facilities. And they look like they've been there for like 200 years. I don't even know how they got to that place. And I'm just, but they're full. There's like always people going in and out of them. And I'm just like, who manages that place? Like it has to be someone who's lived on that property probably for 30 or 40 years and has probably not the best. I'm just making some judgments, but probably not the best operational skill set to, to actually be running that business. Oh yeah. I've looked under the hood a couple times on these deals and you're like, they have no, it's, it's kind of, cr- yeah. It, I've seen some operators that are really just handshake. They're like, well, they pay me cash every month. And you're like, what? That, that I can't get financing on this. And so, yeah, the operation is a big, big deal. You know, banks don't like to see like backdoor cash deals with no leases. It's usually not a good way to get your financing. Totally. I was glad to hear him talk at the end sort of about the oversaturation because that was my number one question going into this. Like you go to just even talk to people who who are new to real estate and they're buying self-storage facilities and that's great. But it just seems like everyone's been doing it over the last like two or three years. It's got like insanely popular and I, I was, I was worried about this overbuilding, but just like he said, and just like we talk about all the time on the show, it's super market dependent. Um, and it sounds like there's still, he said, what, 50% of the self storage units in the country are still owned by those mom and pops. So it seems like there's still opportunity, but, uh, just like with everything these days, uh, there's, uh, you need to be a little bit cautious, uh, especially in those oversaturated markets. Yes. Watch the supply and demand. So it's, it's always supply and demand, whether you're going to hit your metrics or not. All right, sweet. James, thank you as always for being here. Where can people find you if they want to uh, ask you anything? Uh, best way to find me is on Instagram at jdaneflips or our YouTube channel at Project RE. Um, uh, we do lots of free flip tips and you get a look at all the weird stuff we see on a daily basis so check us out <laughs> you got a lot of weird stuff going on man <laughs> oh man i still think I, I i think half the reason i'm a little bit sick is just from these houses like this one house i bought it's <laughs> it's like hung on to me for three weeks i think <laughs> yeah you gotta start wearing a hazmat suit in some of those places <laughs> All right, sweet. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate you being here. If you want to reach out to me, I'm on Instagram at the Data Deli. We will see you all next time for On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. And a big thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show On the Market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.